Uh, thank you everyone for joining us here tonight. Uh, my name is Isaac Baker. I'm the co-director of Community Solar. I'm here tonight to talk with you all about developing and owning community shared solar projects in your community. Um, as we know, we've got some folks joining us uh, from Eastern Massachusetts, from New York. We've got a couple folks from Vermont who are joining us. So we are uh, taking this to the regional level, um, which is what Co-op Power is all about. We've got a lot of communities here represented, and we're really excited to have you all here. Um, so I wanted to go over briefly what we are going to do tonight. Our agenda, um, so we can do some introductions. We've all gotten to know each other a little bit better and what we are interested in working on and our experiences with renewables. Um, what I wanted to share with you tonight, uh, and I hope this can be a really interactive and collaborative uh, approach to this, um, is to share a bit more about who Co-op Power is and what we've done over the past 10 years since our founding, uh, what community shared solar is. Um, it's relatively complex and we're going to try and boil it down and make it bite-sized and workable for everyone here. Um, what the enabling policy and incentives are that allow community solar to work um, in the states we're talking about. And our primary focus tonight will be Massachusetts and New York. Um, developing your own community shared solar project, what we want folks to leave here with is a sense of how you might take an immediate next step to build a community shared solar array in your community. Um, we're going to follow that with the q and A. Uh, I've done a number of these across the Northeast and find that there's a lot of Q's and uh, hopefully we have a lot of A's for you. So we are going to get to that um, very as quickly as we can. Um, and as you'll see after that, for any folks in Massachusetts, as I'm going to get to, we have a couple impending uh, policy changes that are going to come and we are hopeful that we might be able to move some stuff forward before all that happens. So. Um, we're going to talk about that uh, at the end of this presentation. So, to start with, who is Co-op Power and what have we done? Co-op Power is a consumer-owned energy cooperative. We are here tonight in space owned by our local uh, food co-op uh, in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Um, so. Folks, generally speaking, are relatively familiar with consumer co-ops as a concept. Um, little show of hands, how are we doing? Consumer co-ops. Um, so to give the quick once over, co-op power, um, like a food co-op, is uh, you join and you pay a membership fee and you receive benefits from that membership fee. Instead of groceries, we are dealing in energy. Um, so tonight, we're going to talk about how community shared solar in a way that you could participate with an array of solar and some panels that are not on your home how you could receive financial benefits from that through your regional energy cooperative. And that was what Co-op Power was founded to do, and that's what it's been doing for the last 10 years. So, we were founded in 2004. We are a multi-class, multi-race movement for a just and sustainable energy future. The way we implement that uh, mission is that we use renewable energy and clean technology to help build more just and sustainable communities. <coughs> Our governance structure is that we are governed by a group of community energy co-ops. So each one of these represents a board, uh, a board member. We have one board member of Biodiesel, another project that we've worked on here with us tonight. Um, these are all uh, groupings of local localized parts of co-op power who have joined us over the past 10 years. This represents about 500 members across the Northeast thus far who have joined over the past 10 years. Each one of them has a geographic grouping. Um, once a year they elect a board representative who then attends board meetings virtually or in person once a month and help makes, helps make democratic decisions about how the co-op moves forward and does what it does. I and a number of other folks in this room are staff members who live to serve and work for that board that is democratically elected by everyone else here. Um, so that is our structure, that is how we do what we do. Um, as you'll see, uh, of those 500 members we currently have, there's a strong showing in Western Massachusetts where we were founded. Uh, we have a strong co-op in Boston where we've done a lot of work. 
southern Vermont. Um, we've done some work as well, and New York is really emerging for us in large part as we bring community shared solar to a number of places in New York City and in upstate New York over the next year. Um, to go quickly over some of the things that Co-op Power has done, especially for folks who are a little bit new to the concept, um, of those 500 members to date, we uh, have been really good at starting businesses, and that is what uh, a big part of what we've done to help bring, stimulate the local economy. We've been uh, starting off, we worked with a number of solar installation companies in the valley, um, in the Pioneer Valley in Massachusetts, this area that we're in now, to help uh, aggregate customers, connect them with solar hot water, uh, energy efficiency, a number of other products over the years. Um, we've started a couple energy efficiency companies now that are located in the Valley and in Boston. Um, we have a $5.2 million, million biodiesel plant located just a stone's throw down the road from here that is poised to launch in the next couple months. Um, and so these are all, over the course of that, uh, we've said that we've created, helped create about 20 green enterprises, 200 good green jobs over the years, and we have a network of about 7,000 people from Massachusetts, New York, and Vermont that we're connected with, that are on the email list, and are uh, spanning out from our core of 500 anchor members who have joined us in the last 10 years. Now, I want to jump to the meat of the conversation tonight, which is we've done energy efficiency, we've done biodiesel, we've done rooftop solar. What's the next big thing? And that is what we are here to discuss tonight. So I picked up just a few articles to kind of show what's happening online in the world of community shared solar, right? And that's been a real buzzword over the past few years. Um, community solar is gonna explode next year. This new market is unlocking all of this potential for solar. There's a lot of energy and excitement around that. Um, and it's a relatively complex concept. So I want to jump to that and say how and why. Um, people like Forbes magazine are saying this is the next giant thing that's going to change and revolutionize energy, the way we interact with it and how we have it and how it improves the number of renewables that we have on our local grid. Um, so quick show of hands in the room. Are folks familiar with community shared solar as a concept? And they would know in Massachusetts we've had a few billion dollars of solar already get invested in here in this state. Do folks have folks looked at one of the other community shared solar options that have been made available in the state thus far? Mm -hmm. Kind of. Okay, so there's a, what I should say first before we really get into the weeds is that there's a couple different ways to do community shared solar and what we're offering to you tonight is something that we're particularly excited about, but this has not been done in Massachusetts. This is a new and unique way of interacting with an off-site shared solar panel that is facilitated through our cooperative. So we are excited to be sharing this as an option. Um, so to quickly go over um, what community shared solar is, uh, it is technically a solar electric system that provides electricity or virtual net metering credits uh, to electricity, uh, sorry, to electric meters on more than one building. So what this means is that whereas before um, and before the last couple of years we had standard uh, net metering policy, but basically what it meant is that people could put solar on top of their roofs, they could connect it to their electric meter, and they could get credit on their bills for everything that their roof was able to produce. And that is net metering policy, and so if the sun was shining and they weren't at the house, they weren't using electricity, the utility would say, even though you're not there using that electron right when it's made, we're going to still credit you for, for it and pay you for it. Now, what community shared solar is, is virtual net metering. So what it means is that the utility pays customers for each electron that, and kilowatt hour that they produce on one larger solar array. And then we are able to divide up that value amongst a number of community members so that you see it on your electric bill each month. Thus, the value that is created by a shared solar array in one location can be realized by a number of people all in their same area. 
Excuse me. In other words, yes. there's like a community solar farm for the members that are involved. Is that what you're saying? Exactly right. So if we were all part of a community solar array here, this 20 folks in the room, we would be able to build one array place it somewhere in the area that we all operate in. I'm going to talk about how you define that area in a second. But assuming we all have, this pay, have the same utility uh, account, that utility is able to divide up the value amongst all of us, and we're able to tell them how to do that. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. There's more, but I'm sure you'll, you know, it just blossoms. Absolutely. Um, so, why is community, this gets at why folks are so excited about community shared solar and what's possible with it. Um, for one, like going solar on your roof, community shared solar also helps you reduce electric costs. Um, we're able right now with the policy incentives and the cost of solar having come down so much over the, over the last 30 years, we're able to provide power more cheaply than your standard prevailing electric rates from your utility provider. That means by going solar, you can spend less money on electricity, whether you're a homeowner, a business, et cetera. That's, and that's exciting. Um, in some cases, you're able to invest at smaller amounts. Um, it's sometimes easier to, might be hard to get an installer to come out and put two panels on your roof. Feels like a lot of effort for a relatively small project. But when you do community shared solar, you're able to take perhaps a smaller chunk as part of a larger group. So it makes it so your unit might be a little bit smaller. Um, we have the environmental benefits that solar provides, local economy impact, providing good jobs, supporting installation companies and folks who are building and manufacturing solar panels. Um, and this is the biggest point, uh, is that up until now, solar has largely been built, um, especially in the Northeast thus far, I would say on single family suburban homes of folks who have high tax bills, really nice rooftops, and people who are not super price sensitive, um, folks who are able to be early adopters in the solar market. And where we are right now, especially with community solar, is that we're moving towards a more democratic approach to solar, where we're able to involve more folks. And the only prerequisite, rather than having owning your own home, having the right rooftop with the right shingling that's new enough, that's not shaded by the big tree in your yard and all of these things that make it hard to put solar on your roof, um, don't apply in community shared solar. And the only prerequisite is that you need to pay an electric bill. Quick, uh, quick comment if I may. Please. Uh, that uh, I believe that studies have shown that the vast majority of solar has been adopted by middle income folks, not necessarily, you know, uh, High income, suburban folks. Sure. So, middle income, absolutely. But I guess what I meant is, uh, at the very least, below 100% of median income has been generally a harder yeah. place to get solar okay. um, adoption in. But thank you for that clarification. Absolutely. But single family homes where the owner that are owner occupied, that's typically where we're seeing a lot of solar happen. And I'm going to jump right ahead. Um, so I want to talk about this model and how it works. Um, so right now, and for folks in New York, I'm going to circle back with you all about how this is going to work. Uh, what we do as community-based developers is we take all of the policies and all of the complexities about how solar and shared solar might work, and we turn that into a recipe that is standardized, that allows communities to choose the optimum size and all of the optimum pieces to get the most bang for your buck out of all of these relatively complex rules that have been put into place. So given all of those rules, uh, and that have changed dramatically over the last six months in Massachusetts, uh, this is how we came up with our neighborhood community shared solar model. So, what this is going to look like, we're going to go through this in detail, this is the high level overview, um, is that Co-op Power partners with community leaders to develop neighborhood net metering projects. Um, how this is going to work logistically is that Co-op Power is a business that is collectively owned by all of its members and by folks who would participate, is that you would become a Co-op Power member, you would have democratic governance and ownership in our Co-op. We on your behalf are going to lease a site 
where we can put this solar array. So this might be out in the field, this might be on someone's rooftop, wherever it may be, we're gonna lease the site on behalf of the community for 20 years. Um, the financing for these projects in order to get those panels up is going to be provided by everyone who participates in the array based on the amount of power that they use in their home and the amount of panels that they therefore need to cover their bills um, in order to zero them out. Um, Size optimization, this is the really key piece of what we're doing. Uh, we have tried community solar at a number of different sizes over the past year and have explored a number of different options. What, based on all the policies that are in place right now, it is most financially advantageous to build a 25 kilowatt uh, DC project in Massachusetts. So that's a relatively small project. Uh, for a reference, that would be the average homeowner in the Northeast Folks in the solar industry can help me out, but five to six kilowatts, is that feeling like a pretty reasonable assumption there? And creeping up towards seven and eight lately, but yeah. Okay, well, people turn off the plasmas, you know, you know, we're definitely using more electricity as we go, and that's something to think about as you think about buying a share into a shared solar array, is how much your electric bill is gonna increase when you go buy that electric car and <coughs> insert your air source heat pumps and all those other things that are awesome and use electricity. Um, but for the most part, we're gonna say about five kilowatts. So if we build a 25 kilowatt array in your neighborhood, that's a five family project on average. Maybe it's four if folks are, have slightly higher energy bills. Um, this allows us to access the full retail value of that electricity. If we build smaller projects, uh, the state has recently decided that they are going to take away 40% of the value. Um, you mean larger projects? Yep, yeah, sorry. So anything over 25 kilowatts, they have decided that they are going to uh, set in place what's called market net metering. So that will reduce the value of the electricity that gets transferred to your bill on a month to month basis. So our goal is to build small um, and to uh, build many small projects. And because of we're a co-op and we have access to a lot of folks, a lot of land and a lot of uh, different community connections, we're able to think about an idea like that. Um, so I'm excited about that. I wanna say for folks in New York, you are not bound by the same um, policies that have been put in place in Massachusetts. Uh, and the ideal size for a project in New York is gonna be closer to 150 or 200 kilowatts. So that would be more like 15, um, I'm sorry, 200 divided by five is 20, yes. Um, 40. 40, wow. Um, okay, so in any 40 case, to 40. Um, so slightly larger projects are advantageous in New York um, and we can go over a little few more details on that. Uh, what does a consumer offer? So what do you get as you're participating in one of these arrays? Um, it's going to be financially almost identical to what you do when you get to put solar on your own home. Um, what we have been able to figure out and the most exciting part about this model is that we, as a co-op, are able to help you receive the federal tax credit that is worth 30% of any money you put into solar panels. You can get that back as a federal income tax credit against income that you make in that year. That 30% tax credit is a really key part of the incentive for solar, and up until very recently, it has not been possible for us to distribute that out to community members. So our having figured that out is a really big part of what allows this to happen. 30% um, tax credit, excuse me, uh, on your income for that one year, or can it can be it can be carried over over 20 years. Over 20, oh. Yeah. So an example is uh, if you spend $10,000 on solar panels, you get an income tax credit that would be worth uh, $3,000. And whenever over 20 years you end up owing the federal government $3,000, you then don't owe it to them. Um, okay. So that's- It could be owed within 20 years or something. Yep, it can be carried oh, forward. Along those lines, how are, okay, 20 year lease, what's gonna happen if, uh, let's say, um, legislation or whatever changes these? In other words, uh, the rules change. So. In, in short of the 20 year. 
So policy obviously is a really key piece of how these projects move forward and policy has changed a lot. The one thing um, with the exception of what Nevada did, Massachusetts has not, uh, has grandfathered forward projects in the environments under which they were built. That's their history. Their history is that Massachusetts has never put a policy in place and then taken it back away from people who are already operating under that assumption. Um, which is a really important thing to do when you're writing policy is to not renege on your promises. Is that, um, is that true for just solar or in general? Uh, I do not know the, uh, the full policy framework of everything Massachusetts has done, yeah. but I certainly know it for solar. Um, so the federal tax credit, that's been extended for five years at the federal level. That is good. That is going to happen. It's not going anywhere. Um, at the state level, we also have a policy called the Solar Renewable Energy Credit. This provides a big additional subsidy um, that acts as uh, <coughs> your value of electricity, then gets nearly doubled by adding, uh, actually gets more than doubled by adding an incentive um, for producing solar, which Massachusetts has decided is a good thing. And so they are going to pay you extra for the green part of your electron. Uh, for folks in New York, this is not relevant. You don't have that yet, but it's in, in the works at a policy level. Um, so and I'm going to keep running through this. We're going to circle back through it. Uh, and of course, all the power generated, the value of that based on the value of electricity in your area also goes back to you. So you get the tax credit. You do not get, this fe you get the federal tax credit. And actually, I should just jump to the next page. So we're going to circle back to this, um, but there's a lot of good incentives in place that make this very financially advantageous. Um, so I want to go over at a high level what the ingredients are for making this happen, and we're going to get into a little more detail to make this feel real and interactive afterwards. Um, what this looks like uh, is that our model is basically somewhere uh, in Massachusetts, it's really going to be about five families coming together around each little project. Um, and in other places where we're less size restricted, we can have more, uh, fam more households and families participating in each array. Um, for a site, as we always say, best to start with a sunny place. Um, so this is thinking about what's an ideal site for your local community shared solar array. Um, 25 kilowatts, that maximum size that we can build, needs to have about 4,000 square feet, give or take. Um, and it's in the size of like, uh like a professional basketball court. Yeah. Is that, um, Could you repeat that? Whether it's fixed or a tract array, it's just, the, it's just the, the main plate value is all it's considered there? So I'm using a fixed array assumption right now. Um, so right regulations call for that or spe specific about that? Could be either. Um, so you could have a fully tracked array and produce a lot more than what a fixed 25 would produce and still fit under the same rules. Yeah, so, uh, and what, just for everyone, the question we just got is, does that include tracker arrays, which are a different kind of array rather than just a fixed panel sitting in a field? Tracker arrays tend to be a little bit more expensive on a cost per panel basis, but produce a lot more power. Um, so there are trade-offs, and that's a great example of through one of these projects what a community could democratically elect to do. They could say, we're willing to pay a little bit more up front to get more juice over time. We see the value in that, and we're going to collectively decide to do that. Um, but so these are all kind of back of the envelope numbers to give you an idea. As my partner Ben pointed out, 4,000 square feet is about the size of a basketball court. Good to contextualize where we're at. Um, for the 200 kilowatt, um, that's going to be closer to um, closer to an acre, an acre and a half, depending on what size of panels you use. Um, so that's the kind of land sizing that we're thinking about. If these panels are ground mounted, meaning they are hooked up to some kind of racking and they are placed in the ground, uh, in the soil, uh, a few kind of key considerations are that it needs to meet any of the kind of standard uh, setbacks and environmental requirements you would need for building most anything. Making a building a building in your area, it cannot, yep. Um, so just to say that these are kind of back of the envelope uh, development ideas. No, so jump in, please. Uh, just, just as an example, uh, in Montague there are 
specific, the um, planning board set specific run uh, bylaws. So you'd have to check with your your, your community and uh, and see if you have any uh, regulations related to ground mounted systems. Absolutely, that's a great point. And in uh, Massachusetts, because we've had solar developing here a lot more over the past couple of years, most local planning boards and jurisdictions have passed a whole litany of different things you need to comply with in thinking about how you build your solar array. Um, in New York, as you folks know, joining us, solar is relatively newer and all of the planning boards are freaking out about what to do about it. So there are not a lot of policies in place uh, as of yet. Um, so that, those are, these are the general ideas. You need to be 100 feet away from anything that looks like a wetland, a wet area where newts might congregate. Um, any of these pieces you want to be well away from. Um, and conservation easements, things like that, these are all general impediments to building a solar array. Uh, and then, of course, you want to be back from existing structures, from the road, from other um, parcels and things like that. Um, if it's going to be roof mounted, the considerations are a little bit different, uh, but typically you need a good strong building that is able to support some additional load being put on top of it. Um, so that is a really key consideration. And then you need to have good roofing material. So the, ideally the roof is under five years old and is asphalt or rubber and not slate as a key piece. Slate is really hard to put solar on top of. But metal is also easy. Metal is great too, absolutely, I should add that. You can't have metal? No, metal is great. Um, basically not slate is a really good rule. Um, Josh, you have anything to add to that based on your experience? We're good? Okay, great. Um, so those are key considerations. Um, I want to go over just in detail to show you in Massachusetts what you would be eligible for in terms of incentives. Um, these are all the stuff that make going solar really financially advantageous. <coughs> As we talked about, there's a federal residential solar tax credit. So whatever you invest in this solar project, you're going to get 30% back and you can take it all in year one or over 20 years, roll it forward, 30% of the value. We have a state tax credit. It's unfortunately not designed for community solar, so it only works if you have it on your structure. So that is not going to be relevant for this model. Um, we have solar, solar renewable energy credits. Um, as an example right now, um, what that is, is that whenever you produce a kilowatt hour of solar that you're responsible for, as you would be in this model, you get um, a solar renewable energy credit. And right now those are worth around 28 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, you know, $285 per megawatt hour, so then 28 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, so, how many folks know what they're paying for electricity right now? And for New York folks, I apologize, this is all Massachusetts specific. Okay, so what are you, what are you paying per kilowatt hour for electricity? About 18 cents. Okay, so you're paying about 18 cents right now. Um, so that's going to really be this virtual net metering piece, is that whatever electron gets produced <laughs> is going to be worth the value of your electricity that, you would, that you're paying right now at your home. Now, you said you're paying 18 cents. This solar renewable energy credit is worth 28 cents. So put those together, and you're getting paid uh, 36, uh, 46 cents per kilowatt hour, which is a really good amount. Folks good with my math there? My mental math is not as great as I want it to be for presentations. But 18 cents plus 28 cents, 46 cents per kilowatt hour, um, that is a really high incentive rate for a kilowatt hour of solar being produced. And as you'll see, it produces a really good payback. Um, in addition, on top of all of those other things, on top of the 30% tax credit, the 28 cents per kilowatt hour you're getting from uh, the state for the solar renewable energy credits, the uh, Massachusetts 12 to 22 cents per kilowatt hour, depending on where you are and what month we're in and all of these different considerations. Um, you get all of that, and then on top of that, the state added its solar loan program. And this is one of the things I'm most excited about. Co-op Power is really involved in helping move this forward. So the solar loan program means that if you were going to spend $10,000, um, rather than taking that money out of savings or 
you know, getting uh, refinancing in some way, so such that you have ten thousand dollars to invest in solar, the state has incentivized local banks to make you a loan and a very low interest loan. So we have a local bank. Is it UMass Five Credit Union? Is that right? Yeah. So UMass Five Credit Union is making a one point five percent interest loan to folks. Is that right, Sally? Uh, I don't know, but they do cause they do they do charge a um, a fee. Um, and there's a North Brookfield Savings Bank, I believe it is, uh, has a 1.49% uh, interest rate with no fee. Awesome. Uh, under 35,000, something like that. So North Brookfield, we got a couple, we got a lot of different banks in the state offering slightly different loan products, but we have one that's offering a 1.5% interest rate with no other fees attached to it. So that is a really great interest rate. Um, part of how they're doing that is through the solar loan program, the state is buying down the interest rate, making it more affordable for you to get a loan on the basis of solar. They're also doing credit enhancement. If you have poor credit or more limited credit, you uh, may still be able to qualify for this loan because the state has put up more money to help uh, banks be incentivized to do that. They have then, on top of those two things, created uh, additional incentives for folks under various brackets of uh, medium and low income. So if you're below 120% of median income, um, which is in Massachusetts around $85,000 per household, um, if your household files for below that in your given tax year, you qualify for another 20% off your whole solar array. Um, and if you're below 100% of median income as a household, that is below 65,000, um, that is a 30% off your array. So, on top of all this, this 46 cents per kilowatt hour we were talking about between these two and this 30% off you already got and your federal tax credits, this will throw a low interest loan um, with flexible financing options and another 20 to 30% if you meet some low income requirements. Um, so, to contextualize for the ideal person um, who happens as a household, to make somewhere around, let's say, $50,000 per year that they report in household income. You would qualify for the low income subsidy from the state. You would get 30% off here. You'd get 30% off here. So you just cut away 60% of the total cost of the solar. And then you add 46 cents per kilowatt hour for everything that thing produces. I'm not sure about the So that's the that's the main piece. If you do qualify for the low income status, there you would basically the person who's going to most benefit from all of these is a person who somehow makes fifty to sixty thousand dollars and still pays something in federal tax credits. That is the sweet spot of all of these uh, in federal taxes. So in Massachusetts, that is the sweet spot of solar investment where you can get sixty percent of your array paid for by various subsidies and then get all this other uh, value um, on an ongoing basis. That to qualify you for the, uh, the community solar, like at another site, or would it have to be on your home? It's a great point. So what's really great and what we lobbied for when this uh, program was put in place is that it does apply to community solar investments. It has not been used for that yet because nobody in the state has done an ownership-based community solar model. This is the first one that's gonna be done, um, but it is written into the law that this, these uh, solar uh, loans can be applied to community solar investments where the participant owns the array. And since we're doing an ownership model, you own it cooperatively through your co-op, that is ownership, and then you can then qualify for that. Are we good on all these incentives thus far? So I'm going to try and get it, get us a little more contextualized, right? We've gone over the high level, a bunch of heady stuff, a lot of policy pieces. So what does this look like if you wanted to go do community solar in your community? So the first thing we want to talk about, we've already talked a little bit about finding that site, that basketball field in your community, um, you know, the 4,000, 5,000 square feet. And how would you find your participants? The two rules are, and this I will say for folks joining us from New York, this will apply uh, in New York as well, just as it does in Massachusetts, is that you need to be have the same utility company 
Um, we have two main utilities in Massachusetts, National Grid and Eversource. You cannot be in a community solar array with someone who is in another utility company. So your group of five people has to all be in the same utility company. Then you also need to be in what's called the same load zone. Um, utility companies have uh, sectioned the state of Massachusetts into three load zones. So each utility has uh, three geographic areas that they break the state in. So you need to be in both of those. Now we're going to show you a picture to make that a little simpler. Um, and that is a little blurry, unfortunately, but um, I'm going to give you the general idea. So do we see that big orange blob? Um, this is Eversource Western Mass. This is where we are sitting right now. Um, so we are up here, um, and you can join, make a community solar array with anyone who is in that orange blob. Um, so all of those uh, towns are part of Eversource Western Mass. You then see this white area that is surrounding it. That is National Grid Western Mass. Anyone who is in uh, all of this white area, basically from here over, including Williamstown and some places up there to the north, um, can all be a part of the community solar array as well because they're in the same utility and the same load zone. So we just covered the western part of the state. These red blocks are municipal utilities. This does not work in municipal utilities. We can talk about how and why that's true, but it's, it does not at this time. Um, we then have uh, Boston area. So as you look over this way, we have National Grid. Uh, NEMA is the name of it, but the northeastern part of Massachusetts is the whiter parts owned by National Grid that would cover these areas up here and um, largely like that. And then we have Eversource NEMA, which is the basically metro Boston area for the most part. Um, so those are the main four geographic areas in Massachusetts we're talking about. There's also National Grid Southeastern Massachusetts and Eversource Southeastern Massachusetts. So those are all six ways that the state is carved up. Um, so we are focused on all the towns in the orange place where we sit right now. Folks feeling good about those those groupings? So there could be five families all over as long as they're in that same load zone? That's exactly Although right. it's not like to be in the same five mile radius. Hmm. No, I mean we like I like the idea personally of people getting together like literally mm -hmm. right in an immediate geographic area. I think that'd be fun. I like the idea of folks all knowing each other who are participating in this, but Legally, in order to qualify for community solar, all we have to do is meet these very, very basic geographic requirements. Folks all good with that? Um, so this is just a little recap. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about is our project size considerations. We've already talked about why 25 kilowatts is advantageous. What we have decided is that 25 kilowatts is the size we'd like to move forward with and what we're going to do this year. Um, additionally, this model could work um, in many ways better at scale. So we could build a 500 kilowatt array using all of these same principles. Um, and that might take 1.5 acres. We could have 100 households. Um, the challenge right now is we have in Massachusetts what are called net metering caps that cap the amount of solar that can be built at any given time. Um, right now, National Grid has already surpassed it's recently raised net metering caps, meaning we cannot build a solar array there at this time that's this big. So we have chosen a strategy of building these smaller um, arrays that fall below the cap restriction so that the utility can't tell us that we can't build them at any given point. And we like that when we think about these projects. Um, this is a little bit more detail on finding that ideal site. This is kind of the full list. This is more because I'm going to send you the presentation and want you to have the full list. Um, but this is everything you might think of. Southern exposure, no wetlands. We're talking, we want relatively flat land. Um, ideally land that's not super rocky. Exposed bedrock is rather difficult to plug uh, solar into. Um, not a lot of trees or brush, uh, or they need to be cleared in order to build the array. 
uh, road access, neighbors that are really excited about the project and not angry about the project, um, conservation restrictions not being present, um, not having a lot of endangered species and wildlife living right where you want to put your solar array is a good idea. Um, this is actually a kind of important one. In Massachusetts, we have a law that says you cannot have two solar net metering generating facilities on one tax parcel. So if you on your home have already put solar panels and you want to put it in your backyard, uh, you actually can't do that. And so you have to get around the law by subdividing your parcel, um, which we are all for supporting happening. Um, but that takes some time, and so that's just a consideration to make. Um, in addition, you also need to be next to three-phase power lines. This is perhaps the most limiting factor in Massachusetts. Who here knows what a three-phase power line is? All right, pretty good. That's way better than most rooms I've been in, um, which is no surprise given this room. Um, so single-phase power lines, you look up a pole, you look across the top, and you see one little wire running from pole to pole, and it's got your other utility cables running below it. That is single phase, one wire running across the top. And then if it's three phase, you're going to have three wires running across the top with metal spreader bars, um, keeping those three wires from touching each other. So we want to be near the three wires for these projects. That's a new requirement. Does that, does that apply to uh, single owner kind of systems as well? I've got a 40 kilowatt that's on single phase. It shouldn't, it shouldn't grandfather backwards. It has to do with market net metering. But I mean, if, if, if a single household, single owner household is doing the system, does this same implementation apply? To so you could build your 40 kilowatt on single phase and it would be fine to connect, but from a policy standpoint, you'd lose 40% of your net metering credit value. So yeah. it's better to then size it down to 25 and get the full net metering credit value rather than take the huge haircut from the value coming out the other end, um, generally speaking. Um, so. This is an example. Uh, we haven't looked at a lot of photos yet. This is an example. Uh, this, this has actually a nice wood um, construction. That is not typical, but I just like this photo, so I wanted to use it. Typically, you'd have metal racking connecting it to the ground, or as Brian mentioned, you could have tracking arrays, which are those really cool ones that have a little pole and then a square attached to it that tracks around with the sun as it moves around the earth. Those are awesome, too. Um, so the main thing I wanted to note is that ideally we're not using prime agricultural land, which is nice about these uh, relative to these other giant utility scale projects that we're seeing, is that these can kind of fit at the community scale in the little nooks and crannies that we have in our community that might not already be used for prime agricultural land or cutting down forests that we may not want to do to build solar in our community. Um, so this could be the old hay field that's not being used and is sitting right next to the road. Could be a really great spot. One thing that I like to note um, is that, especially in rural areas, this will apply for upstate New York and western Massachusetts, um, the way that these, those three wires we were talking about got spread through the community um, in rural areas was in large part as a result of dairies in our area um, having big chillers for their milk. Um, and needing to have access to a slightly higher grade of power. Um, so if you have some old dairies down the road from you, there's a relatively higher likelihood that you have three-phase power running down your road. Um, that also applies to if you have manufacturing or you know, other kind of large electricity users are going to be likely to need a higher phase voltage coming their way. Um, but that old dairies is often a good thing to look for as you're driving around and doing what I do, which is kind of peering up uh, as you drive through the community and seeing what's going on. Out of curiosity, is that a 25 phase array? This is I'm just wanting to get a concept in my mind. What do you think? This might be 30, 40? Yeah, 30, 40, something like that. That's yep. about This might actually be a little larger than 25, so this might be 30 to 40. OK. okay. Uh, but it's kind of in that ballpark. Okay. Yeah. Oh. But we can't go above 25 in this size of project. No, 25 is our ceiling. So looking at what, um, just three quarters of that. Easy. Building that. 
So uh, the three phase power, that's not, that's not something that uh, the utilities are going to add. You, you'd have to find a site that already has that in place. No, the be whole happy to if you pay for it. Yes. yes. <laughs> they will do anything you want if you fork over half a million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So we are trying to both match, um, from an electric standpoint, 25 kilowatts can easy, easily uh, interconnect to a single phase power line. So that's not a problem, but in order to receive the full value of your net metering credits, by the, which is the value you're gonna show up on your bill, they have ruled that the 25 kilowatt array must be connected to a three phase power line. So that is a policy rule that is not a engineering and actual challenge. Um, so. so it's like something utilities wrote into it? Uh, utilities have been doing a lot of writing recently. Um, so I'm gonna talk over, this is basically, this is gonna be in the packet that you can receive. This is the full list of all the activities that are gonna happen. Who does what and how we build a project together. So I'm not gonna run us through all the details. I'm gonna show you what com communities would need to do. Um, but what we do is what we've done on all the other uh, projects that we've developed. Um, we've been building solar on churches in Boston, developing um, affordable housing in uh, New York City. We've been helping islands off the coast of Maine build a solar microgrid. So we are doing a lot of the development work, working with the EPCs, providing those kind of logistical development services. And what we look to communities for is just a few simple things in, bring in partnering with us to help you make one of these shared solar projects happen. Um, so this is a timeline that you're gonna see in your packet. And for those of you joining us online, uh, that packet has been sent around. Um, so you can be able to look at this timeline a little more closely there, but um, what this is is a timeline of how we could work together to build some arrays by the end of the year. And as we'll remember, those solar renewable energy credits worth 28 cents a kilowatt hour right now, which is a lot of money. Um, that program is ending right smack at the end of the year. So if we want to benefit from that program, we have to build a couple of these before that thing ends. So there's a nice incentive to do that. Um, so that was our whole project flow. This is what communities need to know, right? So if you were to be a co-op power member and you want to build one of these with us, this, these are the five steps. The first step is that we've got to find a site. As we've talked about, we've got to find that basketball court. We're going to throw some solar on it. Second step is we've got to find participants. That's the four to five families who are going to receive the electricity from it. Could be your friends, could be your neighbors. In Massachusetts right now, Co-op Power has a backlog of about 150 people who wanted to participate in our last community shared solar array that was not permitted to move forward by the utility. So if you're having trouble finding friends, we've got a lot for you. Um, the next step, once you have your group in your site and the landowner of that site, is that you make a group development payment. So right now, this is gonna to be to help us develop this project. Um, and so we have a few costs in developing these projects and we ask for communities to make a small payment to Co-op Power to help move the project forward and get it through the development stages. So what that means is this is the pricing. The standard is that if your four families, or each, if you would say you had four families for your 25 kilowatt, you would each put in $1,000 um, to help get the project started and developed, and that's gonna pay for the initial engineering, some of the site assessment work, and some of the development processes in the early parts of moving the project forward. The one note is that right now, because we're a cooperative, we don't have a ton of resources to be making these payments on behalf of all the communities fully at risk. So we ask that since we're building these four communities, the communities provide the capital required to build them. So that's why we have this initial payment. And with these 25 kilowatt uh, projects, what's nice is that the main reasons projects fail is because the utility does not permit them to interconnect or makes it so expensive that you cannot interconnect to the grid. When we build 25 kilowatt arrays, um, those are very easy to permit. They are a simplified interconnection process, move forward in just a period of weeks. And with, you know, it is always possible that they may not move forward, but compared to the risk associated with a large array, these are very likely to move forward. 
Um, and Josh, what would you what would you assess for like the risk of a 25 kilowatt interconnection coming back crazily expensive? I mean, yeah, 25 kilowatt inverters only a few thousand dollars. So I mean, that would be that would be the, the level of potential utility upgrade costs you'd be looking at as opposed to potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars on a larger project. So just. For folks, uh, we were just talking with Josh, who's joining us from one of the design and engineering firms that we've worked with on a few projects. So just saying that uh, compared to one of these large 1.5 acre arrays that sometimes you ask the utility, can I plug this into your grid? And they might say yes, but you'll have to pay us a million dollars to upgrade our grid to accommodate it. With these 25 kilowatt projects, the worst case scenario is you might pay one or two thousand dollars for some transformers and things like that which are very affordable and the project can work with those. Um, so we, this money is technically at risk. We consider it to be a very low risk. Um, once we get over the risk stage, we send all that money right back to you. You join Co-op Power if you're not already a member and you then purchase your panels. Um, so that is the process. So you can think about this as a down payment that will get returned to you as long as the project moves forward and is successfully permitted. Um, so are there any questions on that one through five? Yes. Um, I'm not clear on what, for instance, well, for example, how much the, the membership would cost for co-op power and uh, does that get folded into you know, paying towards your solar or not? Is that a separate cost? So if you're not already a Co-op Power member, it is a separate cost, and it's $250. Um, so that makes you a member of the Co-op, gives you buying rights, and that's the, that's the membership fee, and then you are able to access benefits, one of those being community solar. So step five, purchase panels. Is that inclusive of install the panels, hook them up to the, ele the electric grid, and commission them? and? Know, all the way, all the way through to split the switch, and you're you're generating electrons. Yep. So we are going to see to it that all of those things happen. But once we've gotten to this point, we've gotten through the, what's called the risk stage of the project. We've gotten permission from the utility to build it and all that stuff. So we don't consider it to be a risk. So then, at that point, we feel comfortable selling you the panels. So you pay co-op power the full purchase price that covers all of the costs of installing the panels, and then we pay a construction company to go out and actually build it for us, and then they will go out and proceed with the rest of the stages. Is that helpful? I wonder if you or Josh could talk about just, just the risk in general for that um, improved development payment, because it also includes the local permitting risk, the environmental review risk, I think we could to just disclose that short list of them. So in addition to Lynn, Lynn, our CEO, is asking us to talk about some of the other risks associated with this payment. Um, in addition, we talked about the connecting with the utility risk. The other main risks are associated with the site-specific pieces that don't have to do with electricity. So if, you're on, if your site is on a rooftop, um, that's going to mean the two ways it can fail are that the roof age is too old or it's structurally not sound and not fit to put solar panels on. So if we pay some engineers to go and look into it and they come back and say, you know what, didn't work out. As it turns out, this site is not gonna be eligible for solar, that's a risk. We try and mitigate that risk by we ourselves go and check it out first and at least give it an eyeball. We're not engineers, but we have a lot of experience looking at roofs, so we try and mitigate that before getting to that point of failure. Um, so that's for a rooftop project. On a ground mount, the key considerations are more environmental because you're putting it on the ground. Um, so that's going to be all of those local zoning or ordinances. Uh, if for some reason uh, you are not able to work something out with the local planning board and the local conservation commission, um, based on they find a, they find a mysterious wet spot right in the middle of where you are going to build your array and it turns out that a bunch of endangered nematodes live there. Um, you would then not be allowed to build your solar array there and that would be a risk for this piece. So, yep. So let's say you, know, uh, you want to build this on a rooftop. 
and uh, early on in the process, um, you bring in an engineer and you find out that that, uh, that rooftop is not viable. Uh, even though there hasn't been a full development, co uh, there hasn't been, uh, hasn't gone through the full development costs, would you still forfeit that $4,000? Or would there be, you know, would it be prorated according to the costs that were involved? Um, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think our, uh, we're going to move forward with a bunch of engineers. So we don't typically, and Josh can speak to this too, but you don't typically, um, it's a question in risk mitigation of like, do you do one thing at a time and wait to get permission on the one thing to then start the next, next risk? And the answer is no, often, where we start asking everyone if we can structurally build it, if we can electrically build it, um, because these are small projects and relatively low risk. Um, so for that reason, I would say probably not, because we're going to spend money for all the engineers right away to move it forward as fast as possible. Um, when we build really large projects and there's really significant potential for failure, we do do a more incremental review where we'll ask the utility first can we interconnect? They say yes, we proceed to the next hurdle. We ask the local planning board, can we build it here? And we move through those stages more sequentially. So, are we good on this page? I'm gonna jump off. So, this, um, and we're gonna be sending around after this very detailed financial projections and what I want to say is that a big part of what we're going to do um, is that anyone who's interested in moving one of these forward um, as you'll see here there are a lot of different financial environments that everyone on this call and in this room operate in and so all of your paybacks and projections and the return you expect to get on your investment in solar is related to where you live who you pay electricity to um, so what these are I have this just for Massachusetts. I want to say for the benefit of everyone who's joining us on the call in New York, you are all at this price. So the value of electricity that you would get in New York is about 12 cents, which is similar to Eversource, Western Massachusetts, where we live. I, I just called them today and it's 17.6 uh, cents per kilowatt. So these are the weighted average net metering credit values based on historical rates. So while at this given time, it might be 17 cents here, um, and that's, that's going to be for residential. Yeah. Um, what you're going to get credited at here is actually the G1 rate for a small commercial, um, which is going to be closer to, actually it could be even like 8 cents right now. But as we know, um, the rather funny thing that happens because we don't do any cooling, um, I shouldn't even get into this, but I love it. Um, mm -hmm. So in rural areas like Western Massachusetts uh, or upstate New York, we do not do a lot of cooling. Um, and so our peak load we hit in the winter, which means electricity is most expensive in the winter, which is not as good for solar because solar produces the most in the summer. So the actual average value that you will receive over the course of a year, um, the solar output is not matched with the maximum value of electricity in our area because we hit peak in the middle of the winter you all remember a really bad winter we had two years ago and all the headlines about national grid like 40 percent rate hikes and so it got up to like 22 cents a kilowatt hour in national grid and people were really upset about that i think actually might even got higher than that um so anyway that's the this is uh the result of uh this is not going to show up day to day as sally said this is a result of historical averages of what we think you will likely receive over time for your electricity. Um, so just uh, for folks who are in Eversource, who's, who's in Eversource here? So your value um, for your electricity is going to be 12 cents kilowatt hour. Um, folks who are in National Grid, who are in Western Mass um, or Eastern Mass, you're all going to get 17. That means that for the what we're going to tell you is that you're going to be uh, on the closer to the six-year payback, right? Because you are getting more money for ultimately the same thing. It costs the same amount to build, costs the same amount to find the people and do all the work, and you just get more money for it. If you are in Boston, you get 22 cents, which is awesome. And if you're in New York City, you get 25, uh, highest electricity cost in the country. 
So it, um, anyway, that regional barrier plays a big part into how much money you get for these solar panels that you put in place. Um, I'm going to quickly jump through this, but for the benefit of folks who are on the call, this is the fun map of all of the uh, New York State load zones. Um, as you'll see, Con Edison supplies New York City down to the south. It's a very small radius. you got to all be in New York City. Uh, whereas if you are in, let's say, E, you, your utility provider would either be National Grid or NYSEG and that covers a rather vast geographic area. So you can have uh, friends uh, very far north and very far south all participating in the same community solar array. We don't recommend it. As I said, we like for folks to know each other who are working on these projects together, but these are the load zones that dictate how and where you could participate. Now, what I do know for folks on the call is we have folks calling in from NYSEG E, located here, and we have folks calling in from NYSEG A, out in Chautauqua, I believe is the name of the town. Um, and so we may have some other folks calling in, happy to answer questions when we get to the end. Um, as I send this around, this also includes the names of all the towns so you can see which one your town falls in. Counties. Counties, yes, thank you. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit more just about the back end of our process and I'm gonna try and get to the Q&A very quickly now, but just to say, our main team right now is that we operate at very low expenses and we partner in order to make this whole regional vision take place. So it's very hard for our team to be in everywhere at once in the Northeast. And so these are a list of all of the folks that we work with. Solar One is a nonprofit that we are develop that is based in New York City that we are developing affordable housing solar with there. Um, CoShare New York State is a community-owned shared renewables group that's operating across the state building projects. We participate with them, work with uh, a nonprofit based in Binghamton, Binghamton Regional Sustainability Coalition. They're a local nonprofit that's building a project with us right now. We just submitted our first interconnection with them for 150 kilowatts. We're really excited about that. PV Squared, we've got a representative, Josh Hilsden, here in the room with us. Um, they're a local installer based in the Valley that we're building some projects with. Um, and so we have design, technical, installation partners that we work with to implement the pieces. Um, we have a really great partner in Latham and Watkins, um, who are the legal team who have agreed to help us put together all this stuff so that we can do cool things like guarantee your tax credit. Um, and so that's our team and we've worked with a number of, this is just a small showing of all the partners we work with in the region um, in order to make this happen. And what's exciting about it and why we think the regional co-op is really valuable is that with a relatively small team, we're able to serve a large number of people and make it affordable and low cost for a lot of people to participate in community shared renewables. Um, this is all going to be relatively obvious, but I just want to say our development principles to go over um, a few things in energy and energy development. Everything is going to be better together. We like to do community-led planning. We like to make sure that everyone's at the table before we start that process so that when we get to the planning board, when we get to the conservation commission, we have already talked with everyone in the community and everybody's excited to see that project go forward rather than doing it the other way, which is what a lot of developers do and they end up with a bad result when they go and try and uh, force a project through a permitting stage for a community that doesn't want to see solar panels there, or things like that. So we like to, by bringing folks together, there's actually a significant cost savings in developing these projects because you don't spend time uh, litigating with towns and municipalities and things like that. Um, so we believe it's the right thing to do and it's the better thing to do. Um, Affordable and accessible, as we've said, we strive to have financing options uh, that make our, all of our projects accessible regardless of income. That's been a mission for the start for every service that we provide. And then, of course, local ownership we've already identified and local contractors were feasible. We are committed to uh, when we decide to build projects, almost 80 to 90 percent of the total cost that you will pay to us for your solar panels goes to pay a contractor to build those panels and to permit it and to site it. 
that's a lot of value that we want to keep in our community. So we're going to opt to probably not pay Solar City, and we might rather pay the folks who are living, eating, and working in your community with you. Um, so those are our principles, broadly speaking. Um, as, I, as we've said, we've already looked at this, so I wanted to just give you a sense of, again, make this very real from a financial standpoint. We're building that 25 kilowatt array, right? Basketball size field. Um, you're going to own it directly. So legally, you are going to purchase these panels. Um, and this is actually a really important legal distinction. You're going to sign a contract that says, I own these panels. So you are going to say, this, Brian, is going to be my set of 10 panels right here. And I'm going to legally own them. And I am going to legally agree to co-locate them on an array owned by my local energy co-op. And that is a rather boring legal distinction, but is the basis by which you can get the residential tax credit, which is important because we all want 30% off our solar. So that's the legal foundation of this whole thing working. Um, so everybody gets to, we, you can get a little plaque, write your name on your 10 panels, and there they are. They are producing power for you. Um, what we've said is that an all-in cost to develop one of these might be about 370 a watt. Um, right now, we've got relatively high contractor prices for moving projects forward. We're going to work with contractors to get high quality panels and to get um, a lowest cost install. So what we do whenever we build projects is that we put these out to bid. Um, so we work with a number of local contractors and we make sure that we're getting a competitive price for you. And often what we'll do is we'll say, we're not just building one 25 kilowatt array, um, or as it's in the case of New York, we're not just building one 150, we've got 10 communities going forward. So you contractor, we're not just gonna sell you one of these at a time, we're gonna ask, we're gonna tell you, there's this whole portfolio of projects, and that might be an incentive to give a slightly, again, reduced price, similar to what you might see in a solarized campaign that we have going on. Um, so those are all the ways we try to bring that price down for communities. Um, and again, that's the price before any tax incentives, that's the, the, the full price of it, if you were. You're just buying exclusive any, any tax credits or whatever. That's correct. So this is literally the all-in cost of the project. Now, so the average buyer, if you get five kilowatts, that puts you at $18,500. As we showed earlier, you get that 30% off right away, so that's $5,500, and then you get other incentives if you meet those low income designations, things like that, and then you make money back over time. And that's the basis by which you bring that cost down, have access to financing if you don't want to put that cash out right in year one. And um, that's the main piece. Yes? Uh, just to note that um, in this program, because you own the shares of solar, because that, you, that belongs to you, legally that allows you to participate in the mass solar loan program you can't do that if you're participating if you get community shared solar through ppa or power, power purchase agreement or lease correct um, so that's an advantage of this this uh, design so, so the legal nuance that those legal hoops i just talked about where you actually legally sign a contract owning these panels is actually doubly good as sally just pointed out it also qualifies you for the solar loan program which was designed to incentivize ownership because the state said when you own stuff you make the money banks don't make the money uh, could you expand on the site ownership, though? I understand about the panel ownership, but what kinds of sites are possible? Does one of the five people have to own the site? Can you lease the site from someone else? Could it be a municipal site you know, that you make a lease payment to the town? What, what sort of ranges are, what kind of options are possible? Absolutely, that's a perfect question. And I didn't actually get to cover this in the presentation, but it is, Phoebe, you, actually, do you want to speak to this, Phoebe? Yeah, Can sure. Just put that to. together. So, if, <coughs> um, I would love to stand up and turn it. Um, so when we're thinking about these small community-owned projects, um, the, the best case scenario is a privately owned piece of land so that you don't have to go through the process with the town or deal with publicly owned land. So a private land, um, and the way it works is that the best case scenario is that it is one of the five um, members of your team that you're doing this community solar with um, who has that and, and the way that we've set up the incentives for that is that the um, individual or household who's leasing the land to you um, would get a 10% discount when they're initially buying into the project 
um, in exchange for, for the use of their land. Um, we would be able to also have a scenario where someone who isn't interested in being a part of the community solar project could lease their land um, to their neighbors, to their friends who are doing the project. Uh, because of the small size of the array, uh, the lease payments to that person would be pretty low, pretty moderate. Uh, we were calculating in about, uh, they could be paid about $250 a year, sort of a small compensation for the use of their land. Um, but as, as you can tell by that, they would, want, they would need to be someone who is really interested in supporting this sort of a community project. And to speak to the municipal part, um, in order to site anything on municipal land, they have to go through a public bidding RFP process. Um, and on top of that, not that this is a bad thing, but they do require fully unionized labor for all of the construction that takes place on that land. So that adds to the project cost pretty substantially with prevailing wage rates. And then you have to spend a month, five months, a year working with your local municipality to go through that whole public bidding process and it is just a real hassle. Um, that being said, we want to work with municipalities and are thinking about ways to do that. Just wondering if, if the town office is going to be in support of all of these community projects, is there a way that the town can sign themselves on as one chairman, one member of this project and then sign on to multiple projects in order to support the community? So the town, um, this model works only really for individual residences and also for businesses, but you have to pay taxes. So the town technically could do this, but municipalities are non-taxable entities like nonprofits, so they would not benefit from a relatively large incentive that is available for this. Um, so towns are more typically going to buy into these large arrays that are investor owned and are being given a PPA at a fixed price discount is more typical. Um, and those we would love to be doing but require hundreds of thousands of dollars to develop these many acre sites and they're a little bit beyond our current financial capacity. So that is a aspiration but not something we're focusing on right now. And then beyond that question, if one unusually generous individual were to, um, to participate in several of these projects around their community, is that allowed their name to be on multiple projects of this size? There wouldn't, so the way that it worked, I mean, they could give money away for other people to have panels. That's certainly possible, and we would love to facilitate that happening. But there's no real advantage to them being a part of directly of multiple projects, because they're just going to receive power um, for the amount that they put in. So they could, you know, and anyway, there's a lot of IRS stuff that has to do with you paying more for yours so someone can pay less for theirs, and like the IRS doesn't like a lot of funny business when it comes to calculating tax credits. So thank you guys all so much for coming out. <laughs>